So, hey everybody, um, we're gonna give it a couple minutes to uh, let, let some more folks sign in here. But um, what we're gonna do today, we're gonna do some shell molding. I'm gonna do it a couple different ways. I'm gonna do it on the, uh, on the tempering unit, on the Selmy automatic tempering unit. And then I'm also gonna do it by hand so that we can do that stuff. Um, hopefully we'll have a bunch of questions that would help me out a little bit and get us prepared for, you know, making sure that we're answering what you need answered about some of this stuff. And we'll try to talk a little bit about some things that I think is important for the whole process. Um, it is gonna be a little louder today in here than normal because a tempering unit has got a compressor that's turning on and off. So we'll uh, try to get that off as quickly as possible um, so that we can, so I can be heard a little better. Um, and as always, my friend Mike is in my ear. Um, because I, when I back up from the when I back up from the screens, I'm not going to be able to uh, read uh, the questions real well. Because I've reached that point in my life and my age that I can't quite get there. Hey, look, and Kiki von Wigglesworth is here. So anyway, so we're going to do, um, like I said, we're going to do shell molding today. We're going to use a polycarbonate injection mold. For those of you wondering, we're using. On our item code I1637. It's a little square with a cocoa pod in the bottom of it. Um, hence my cocoa pod on the screen that you probably can't see on Instagram, but you can see on Facebook. Um, and uh, but fundamentally the process really doesn't matter. So if we think about what we want to do today, we want to make a shell, right? So fundamentally all we're gonna do, we're gonna fill this cavity up completely with chocolate. We're gonna vibrate any air bubbles out of it, and then we're gonna turn that upside down, and we're gonna let the chocolate come out of it. Depending on which form we're using, whether you're using the tempering unit or we're gonna use the bowl is how we're gonna do it. It's gonna be a little different, but it doesn't really matter. The process is the same. Now, how thick do we want our shell, right? Good question. We want our shell the right thickness. So, we talked, um, I don't know, last week, a couple weeks ago? When did we talk, Mike? When did we talk about, um, um, shell molding. When we talked about 3D molding, what, last week? I think? I'm waiting for Mike to answer. We talked last week about, sorry Mike, I caught Mike off guard, he was like taking a nap or something, like getting a sandwich from the kitchen. Um, uh, so we talked last week about, about three-dimensional molding, right? And we said that the goal there for our thickness is the right amount of thickness depending on what we're gonna do with the piece, right? Here's kind of the same conversation, right? There's a couple things that, that affect that, right? How thick our piece, what are we gonna do with it after we take it out of the mold? Is it going to the case? You know, is it, is it not gonna be handled all that, that gently? Or is it gonna be handled gently and so we don't have to worry about how thick it is? Or, or is it gonna get beaten around a little bit the way we pack it and the way we move it and what our customers are gonna do with it, okay? There's also a cost piece here too. Um, so there's a question from Sweet Legacies and I'm gonna answer it right now just because I can read it. If you don't have a shaker table, will the design create lots of air bubbles even if you tap the mold? I'm gonna come back to it. Okay, so the thickness of our chocolate matters, right? It also, there's a cost component. So is the chocolate less expensive than the filling, which, is, which has got more cost in it? Today we're gonna to be using Jeanduilla, right? That we made ourselves with hazelnuts that are $12 a pound or something. Okay, so my filling is more expensive. Now, that may not be the end all, this, end all of that decision if we're priced accordingly, all right? So, also our thickness is gonna depend on viscosity. So that gets into that question that Sweet Legacies just asked too, right? Um, hey, Carrie. Carrie's, Carrie's on, on Facebook, so I'm saying hi to Carrie. I would love that, thanks for checking in. Um, so, if we have an intricate mold design, which this one is not particularly intricate, all right? And we have a fairly viscous chocolate, all right? We may need a shaker table to be able to get the air bubbles out of it. But again, that gets back to tempering, which we talked about. Mike, we talked about tempering when? When did I put chocolate on the marble? Two weeks ago. I don't even know. The time is all running together. Is time running together for you guys too in this quarantine thing? Because like my time's all over the place. I, I don't know what day it is anymore. Um, and it is Tuesday, thank you Mike. Mike just reminded me it was Tuesday. I put it up on the board too. It's Tuesday, April 21st. Um, 
So, um, our chocolate viscosity is gonna matter on this stuff too, right? So as we're, as we're shell molding, if we want a thin shell, we need a, a, a less viscous chocolate, okay? Also keep in mind too, that when a chocolate manufacturer tells you viscosity, that is in its melted state. So we really need to make sure that we're checking what our, our viscosity is when we're in the temper and in the, in the way that we're tempering, all right? Because viscosity is a moving target, all right? Speaking of chocolate, thanks again for my friends at Plummer and my Revere 70% in my machine today. Um, appreciate the uh, generous support. Okay, so we're gonna put chocolate in here, we're gonna fill them, we're gonna dump them, and then we're gonna turn them and we're gonna have a hole. And then what we'll do is we'll fill it with some Jandouille and then we'll cap it. So that's the plan for today. So um, with seeing no other questions, without further ado, let's get rocking and rolling. I'm gonna start on the Selmy um, and then what we'll do is we'll put some chocolate in my big stainless steel bowl and then we'll, we'll do some molding traditional style. Sound good? Great. Hey, by the way, um, Thanks for spending part of your afternoon with us. It means a lot to me. I appreciate that there's, you know, 30 some people watching right now today. I mean, I know there's lots of other Netflix to watch. There's lots of like binge watching to do. So my chocolate is um, at 86 degrees right now, 86.3, I said at 86.5. I know we're in temper. I'm not gonna take a test. Normally I'd recommend if, you know, if you're, if you're tempering some other way, you're gonna wanna make sure that your chocolate's in temper. Um, Last week we showed you, you know, the old, the French method, right? A little chocolate on the spatula. Um, we could use a piece of parchment paper to do the same thing. Um, I'm not gonna wait for that because I know my chocolate from temper. I'm 99.9% .9 confident that all is well here. So, um, like I said, I'm gonna fill all my cavities. One of the things that I'm gonna do here that I think is pretty important is I'm gonna take all the chocolate off the short edge. All right, and I take the chocolate off the short edge, right, because it makes less of a mess, right? I only have one short side clean up rather than a bunch of other sides. There's a bunch of the long sides to clean off the chocolate. Uh, we talked last week too, I'm not a big fan of cleaning chocolate bowls. I think Christopher, uh, Elbow, and I talked about that on Friday. He's not a big fan of cleaning chocolate bowls either. Um, so if they don't get dirty, I don't have to clean them, right? So it's a little short in one of the cavities. So you can see my mold is fairly clean. That's the one side that I had chocolate on, right? And normally what I would do, I'm just gonna get all kinds of loud in here. Up in here. It's gonna get loud up in here. We're gonna drop it on the vibration table. And we're gonna turn that on for just a second or two. Alright? Like I said, this mold, I'm not particularly worried about getting air bubbles because there's not a ton of detail. I'm also not particularly concerned about it because my chocolate is not over crystallized. It's in pretty good shape and it's flowing pretty well. Alright? At that point I'm gonna pick my mold up. And the nice thing about this tempering unit is I have this bowl to drain right back into. So I'm going to drain it in. And then I'm going to scrape the top of the bowl. Okay. It's pretty clean. But I'm going to come back and I'm going to scrape it one more time. And get some of the liquid chocolate off the sides because I don't want to deal with it. Alright? So, we're here, right? Now we're into the classic debate about praline. Which way does it go on the table? Many moons ago, when I was in culinary school, we learned, or I learned, that my molds went like this, and we allowed them to drain, usually on a piece of parchment paper. Okay, and we did that to get rid of any excess chocolate that was in the bottom, and also to make sure that the chocolate that was in the mold was crystallizing cleanly from the top, from this side, okay? 
I don't work that way, unfortunately. I can't, I can't see where everybody can see me on both screens. I go that way. I go that way for a really specific purpose. I'm trying to create a beveled edge on that chocolate piece. And I'm going to bring the whiteboard over. Okay? If I go this way with a piece, right, I do drain. And I kind of get this. All right? So I get this nice thin shell at the top, any excess chocolate, you know, drains, and I get a nice visual indicator of where it is. However, if I go this way, I get a beveled edge, and yeah, I do probably get a little thicker on the top, and I get a beveled edge, all right? Now, this is a visual indicator too for me to fill my, my filling, in this case, my Jean Duya today, all right? But then I get more surface area for my for my cap, or what my Italian friends call corking. When I go to cork it, all right. Here, sure, I get this nice visual indicator of where to stop my filling. Okay, but now I have to put chocolate in there. So I put chocolate in, and what happens a lot of times is that we trap air right here. And for me, my fear is that that creates a place where I can start some microbiological contamination. Okay, now, having said that, we started this conversation by saying that if I put my molds on the counter this way, right, if this is my mold, I get heat exchange, right? My heat comes off and I get nice, I get nice temper, right? If my room, my room's a little warm today, Okay, because I don't put I don't put my shells in the fridge until after they're capped. Okay. But if I put them this way, right? Think about it. Now my shell, the outside of my shell, the thing my customer sees, where my colored cocoa butter is, the thing that I want my guests to see is is not getting heat exchanged because my table is right here. So this space gets warm and I risk taking this chocolate back out of temper. So what do I do? All right, there's a couple things. I don't know if you can see, I've put this mold on two caramel rollers and I've gotten it up off the table, right? So there's room for heat exchange, all right? If I'm doing a lot of molds, this isn't a bad idea with air blowing on them, all right? One of the things that I see a lot when we have problems with temper is we take that mold, right? And we put it on a sheet pan. And we put it on a sheet pan with another mold, right? So if this was a, a full size sheet pan, there'd be six molds on here, right? They're all giving off heat, all right? They're giving off heat. That heat risks taking the chocolate back out of temper if you don't create some environment where there is heat exchange, all right? So heat exchange can happen in this case. There's only one, there's enough airflow I'm moving around. But if I'm doing a series of molds, can I get them up off the counter and put a fan on so that, there, there's, that it allows the chocolate to crystallize? Just an idea. Or can I put them on a rack? You know, can I get pans that are perfed? Or can they go on you know, a drying rack or something that allows air to move? You know, so those are just some ideas on how to do that. All right, so I'm aware that all of you don't have cell meats. My friend Mike will fix that for you, right Mike? Let's see what he says. Yeah, Mike's like, Mike said you bet. So if you need help when you want to sell me, call Mike or call any one of this hardworking team who are happy to take your call. They're all working from home. But you can call the main line and, and check this out. But actually, to be serious, if you, have more, if you want more information about sell me, you can start at tomrick.com great place to start. You can send us an email there about any of our products. You can also call us 716-854-6050. Uh, um, and like I said, our sales team is all working from home and they're there to answer your questions and all that good stuff. So I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to take tempered chocolate out of my machine for the next part of our exercise because it doesn't really matter how the chocolate got tempered, right? Okay. So also, it's fairly warm in here today. It's probably 72 in here. 
as the heat's on, because it's still snowing outside in Buffalo. I'm so over the snow. I'm over it. I want it to be go. I want it to go away. All right. Um, so, but you can probably see, even though it's warm in here, these shells are starting to crystallize already. Right? They're starting to set. No chocolate's coming out of them anymore. All right. And that's without me going into the cooler. Right? I don't like going into the cooler at this stage because I don't want these to actually be able to come out of the shells until everything's together, until I got soup. Okay. So, sweet legacy, so that kind of answer your question? Okay, Chef Buttercup. So, for those of you who can't see it, um, just ask me, what about putting a mold on the side to like crystallize? Okay, so, we were joking, I forget who was here. Oh, we had some, some of our friends from up in Montreal that were here, right? And we were talking about the fact that this is, for me, this is becoming a very, this is, this is the norm for me, putting the mold cavity up, okay? I learned this way, and the guy that was here was from Montreal, trained in France and all that stuff, and we're talking about space. And then I said, but the Belgians, I'll put them like this. And I think it's because their country's smaller and they don't have as much room. I don't know, I, I, I don't like doing that because if I do have extra chocolate, it's gonna, it's gonna slide to one side, right? I would rather see it on the table like that than like that. Oh, that's me. That's one of my little idiosyncrasies. Sorry. Anyway, so we're going to set all that aside. Okay, we're going to pull out my bullet chocolate. And hopefully everybody can see this. So, now, if we're trying to work super clean, super clean, we could pipe, right? We could do something that avoids getting chocolate everywhere. I'm going to ladle. So I save a plastic bag today. Okay, so I'm gonna start, and I'm just gonna do a run down one side. Okay, remember before when I only wanted to take chocolate off one side? I'm only so far I only have chocolate on one side of my mold. Right, it's on the side that's facing me, and I can't turn it without making a mess. So I'm then gonna do the same thing. I don't know if you can see it. I've got this scraper at a 45 degree angle. So that my chocolate, for the most part, goes over my short side. It doesn't go over my long side. So I come in and I do exactly the same thing on that side. And then I take the chocolate off the center. I so a little more. All right. So there's a very important chef in my life who's named Anil Rohira who is probably sleeping right now because it's like 2.30 in the morning in Mumbai. And I learned a lot of what I know about chocolate from Anil. I learned how to temper from Anil. And Anil came into my kitchen one day as I was tempering and I had chocolate all over my coat. And he asked me a question about that and he said, hey, Brian, what's up with the chocolate on the coat? And I said, sorry, chef, I'm working with chocolate. Chocolate's messy. And he looked at me and he said, Brian, is the chocolate messy or is it the chocolate here? And a lot of this is about practice, right? So it's about working really hard. Okay, so here's my vibration. No, I'm not using the sharp edge because I don't want to hurt my mold. I'm using the plastic, the rounded corner. I mean, I can do this too, okay? And I'm giving it a little bit of love, right? The other thing that we often do, right, is we talk about banging on the table, right? I'm a big fan of two corners. And that's all it really needs. I don't need to like, I don't need to whack on it, right? All right, so I'm here. Now what? Now I gotta get the chocolate out. So I'll bring my bowl back for my Instagram friends. I'm gonna turn it upside down. And again, How loud was that, Mike? Was that really loud? I can't tell, because I'm echoing it by myself. Uh, okay, so the bulk of my chocolate is out. And I'm gonna come along, and I'm gonna scrape the bottom. Okay. I'm gonna get chocolate off everywhere I can. Now, I'm gonna look in the corners. You probably can't see it. I have a little more chocolate than I want. So I'm just gonna come back one more time. And 
see right over the top of that. And again, I'm gonna scrape. And I'm done, all right? So, keep in mind that me doing it that way, back into the bowl of my tempered chocolate is gonna risk over crystallizing this chocolate, all right? So, sometimes if I'm doing one or two, or if I'm doing a bunch, I won't dump back into the same bowl. I'll dump into a different bowl, all right? Because you can see like this chocolate, for example, is set, right? I'm scraping my scraper. If I put this back into this bowl, what's gonna happen? It's gonna wanna over crystallize that. So for me, I'm just gonna put that in my temper, but you can have a bowl for scrap that when I come along and I scrape this mold again as the chocolate's crystallizing, right? I don't wanna put that in this bowl because all it's gonna do is it's gonna over crystallize that bowl. And we were talking a little bit before about viscosity issues, right? And about how much shaking, if I'm over crystallized, then I'm gonna get uh, more, it's gonna be harder to get the chocolate out. Okay, make sense? Cool. All right, so we've got a couple molds here, right, that are ready to be filled. I'm my Janduya, right? It's at about 89 degrees, all right? Why is that important? It's kind of a trick question, most of you know. The reason it's important that is if this chocolate, or this, if this filling is warmer, then my crystallization temperature, so let's say that's 90 degrees, 91 degrees, I'm gonna take the chocolate out of temper here and my pieces aren't gonna unmold. Now, that's a bit of a balancing act, right? If, if this is too cold, it's not gonna flow very well and I'm not gonna get um, a good, it, I'm not gonna get it all the way down in the corners without shaking, right? Also, the warmer that I deposit it, the, um, the softer it's gonna be when I eventually go to, to um, unmold, okay? Makes sense, hold on one sec. Sorry, I dropped my, I dropped the clip. So anyway, um, so somebody just asked what chocolate we're using. Today we're using um, Blummer's Revere 70. Uh, because it's got almost 40% butter and it's a nice for a shelling. Um, do you add any cocoa butter to your chocolate in the cellmates? Uh Not usually. Uh, it depends on the chocolate, right? So from time to time, if we're using a more viscous chocolate that needs a little help, we'll add a little bit of something to it. But in this case, um, all we're doing is we're using chocolate directly out of the box. Okay, so I'm gonna fill these molds. Right? Nice even pressure from the center. I'm lifting while I'm doing that. In a perfect world, what I want is I want my shell to be even thickness all the way around, right? So that, so that the base is about the same thickness as my sides. So they're pretty full. Also keep in mind that most of our ganaches, as they crystallize, are gonna contract, right? So that the fat's gonna contract and it's gonna, it's gonna cause the, um, the filling to settle in, right? So I have a fairly small hole in this bag, so my ganache doesn't go everywhere, or my jandu in this case doesn't go everywhere. I'm channeling my Italian friends using our jandu today. Cool. Uh, Mike's telling me I got a couple shout outs on Facebook, which I can't read because it's on my phone, not the iPad. So, who's saying hi? Hey, Victor. We're making pralines today. And Rasha has a question. So, Mike's about to ask Rasha's question. Yes, so the question was, how do you fix over crystallized chocolate? Do you heat it up, what, sorry, do, do you heat it up or do you retemper it? It depends how bad it is. Like, um, I don't know if you can see it. This bowl, probably can't, is starting to crystallize on the sides, right? Because the bowl was cold, it was out of the dish room. It's probably 62 in there, right? So with that, I could probably hit that with a heat gun. I just have to be careful not to take it back out of temper. Um, if it reaches a place where it's not usable anymore, um, 
then we're going to do, uh, sorry about that on the Facebook feed, I got a phone call and I forgot to hit do not disturb on my phone. So anyway, why do I need Melissa's address, Mike? Somebody's asking me to need their address. Got it. Okay. So it's because Victor's making pralines too and I guess Melissa wants them. So anyway, this piece with my filling in it, normally what I would do is this is going to go into, on my rack. I'm going to allow the, I'm going to allow the ganache to crystallize at room temperature. Um, I do that so that I get my contraction and I do it so that when I go to cap, I get a nice clean edge. And if I were to try to fill this right now, it would move, right? Now, I also don't want to put it in the fridge right now because it will artificially contract and it will contract quickly, but my center may not be completely contracted. And so over time, what's going to happen is as things contract again, or they continue to contract over time, it's more likely to create a leaker, which we don't like leakers. Leakers are bad. So anyway, for now, I'm just going to put it right there. Okay, so under the counter, it's like the miracle of TV. I have um, a shell that we did earlier that we filled with with our Jean Vuillet earlier, right? And so I need to cap this, right? I'm going to do it on my friend the Sony, just because it's faster, it's a little cleaner. Um, so the question again is what chocolate? Today I'm using um, Revere 70 is the chocolate I'm using, which is a question on Instagram. But, you know, it kind of doesn't matter, right? I mean, using a chocolate that has good viscosity, that has the flavor profile you like, that matches nicely with your ganaches. I a lot of times use different chocolates for my filling and my, and my, and my shelves, right? Because I may be trying to do something or create a flavor profile that I want in my ganache, and I don't want the shell to get in the way with that. So I tend not to use really, really, really flavorful chocolates in my shell, um, uh, but that's me. So do I heat the mold before capping? I'm in the not heat camp, because in theory, this is at room temperature, right? I haven't created over crystallized chocolate, right? It's been sitting on the shelf at 70 degrees in here. I'm not that worried about it, all right? Um, so the question was, do I heat the mold before? You know, and I can be persuaded to see the other reasons for that. My fear is, what happens with me is it, so I pull the heat gun out, right? I'm gently doing one, I'm gently doing two. Somebody comes in and they ask me a question and I'm not really paying attention and suddenly, you know, I've gotten, um, I've gotten uh, some of that of temper and I put the chocolate on and it doesn't cause, get back in the temper or I've, over, I've overheated the, um, my ganache. You know, that's me. So now I've got the voicemail on my phone, so we'll make that go away too. Um, cool, so let's just, let's just cap. So the, somebody's asking a question about there's heat coming off. Yeah, there's heat exchange everywhere, right? It's, um, you know, lots of different ways. I don't know if you can hear it. I can hear this. This one's actually unmolding while I'm holding it because we did it early this morning. But, Anyway, so I'm gonna go chocolate on this. Right? And they all need a lot of chocolate. Right? Because there's not a lot of space to fill. But again, I'm doing that same process where I'm at a 45 degree angle. Right? But in this case, I'm also giving a little bit of I'm I'm pressing pretty hard on that because I'm trying to drive chocolate down into that into that cavity, right? We talked before about we don't want to create air pockets. Same deal here. So we've got to give it a little bit of force to make sure that everything goes away. All right. So I didn't quite have enough. So a little bit extra there. I clean the sides of my mold. Now, another debate. Am I done? with this. Um, I'm not sure. It depends. Um, it depends how, how good a job I did of filling my mold and how much chocolate's there, right? So as my chocolate's crystallizing from time to time, we'll get a little, we'll, we will sometimes get a little dip in there, right? Um, I will uh, sometimes come back and I'll cap them again. Depends on how many I'm doing, you know, how perfect they need to be. 
how big my, how bad my OCD is today, you know, those kinds of questions. So I'm gonna, I'm turning that off so I can hear you and you can hear me. Probably so you can hear me because I can't hear you at all. Um, but uh, I don't understand this question. Can you give some other examples of cholesterol lines based on viscosity? Um, so, oh, other chocolate lines. Damn you, autocorrect. Um, you know, everybody's got a good chocolate for, for shell molding. You know, I mean, like from, you know, real premier top of the line Valrona stuff and people like that up down to conventional American chocolates. It's really about finding that right mix of viscosity and flavor that you're looking for to be able to do the things that you want to do. Um, we work with chocolate for most, most people in the industry. You know, there's, there's blubber here, there's some Cargill stuff here. There's definitely some Valrona, there's cocoa berry, there's some um, Calipo, there's, uh, what else is here? There's some guitar here. Um, there's all kinds of chocolate in this kitchen. I get pretty lucky, you know, that I get to work with a bunch of different things. My, on darks, I like to target a cocoa butter percentage somewhere between like more than 37%. But if I get much above 40 then, I start to have other problems where it's too thin and it becomes challenging for shell molding. Especially for, you know, for three-dimensional figures. For pralines, it's okay. I don't mind if it's really thin. Um, but also we do panning, right? So I like to have a lot of butter in my chocolate. So I tend to look for least vis less viscous chocolates for the things that I do, uh, just because it makes my job easier, right? And, I, and I'm not as worried about, for things like that, I'm not as worried about flavor up front. I mean, when we do recipe development, obviously we're always worried about flavor, but we're worried a lot about functionality with, our, with what we're doing and with our equipment. So, kind of answer the question, I hope. No, okay, I'm, Mike says I have another question on Facebook and I can't see it. So, fire away, Mike. Um, Linda was, Linda asked if it were my mold set before I put my filling in. Um, in this case, it was because we did that mold a couple hours ago. Generally, um, I don't care as long as my filling's not moving or as long as my chocolate's not moving when I put the filling in, right? I actually like to do it closer to when I shell. Um, because I find that I get a better, when, when my contraction starts of everything, I get a better result, right, in general. But I mean, that's, that's neither here nor there. So this mold has been in my fridge, and my fridge is like, yeah, this, my under counter fridge is set at um, 10C or 50F, which is, for me, what I like that space to be. Um, particularly dry, so not humid. Uh, this fridge doesn't have a blower, so it tends to stay uh, fairly humid free. It's probably like, it's pretty dry in our kitchen today. It has been because it's still winter. So it's about 45% RH in here right now. Um, but that fridge is definitely that. So we're not worried about moisture contamination. Um, so what you can see, I think you can see that for the most part, these are ready to come out. They, they've, they've unmolded. I'm still gonna give a little tap. Uh, let's see. Oh, all at one. So, and we have, they all came off. They all came out. Um, and a lot of that is a product of a bunch of things, right? So I get asked that question a lot about, you know, why won't my pieces come, come out? One is a good mold, right? One is a mold that, um, uh, that doesn't have angles that don't come out. The, the, guys in the, the guys in our tooling department know all the serious math about this stuff. I think it's seven degrees. We have to have seven degrees on a mold, and they need not have back drafts so that they are able to come unmolded. Otherwise, you need to use something like silicone, right? They also need to be, the, you know, clean, right, and don't, don't have debris in them. So a chocolate from last time, you know, whatever it may be, right? The next important thing is uh, chocolate in really good temper, right? So if my chocolate's not in good temper, it's not gonna, it doesn't really matter, right? Um, and then amount of time necessary for crystallization, right? So, you know, in this box, these pieces were here, we did them right before we started, so it is about 2.35. So they've probably been in there 45 minutes, which is longer than they probably really need. Um, we actually shelled and filled yesterday, 
and then we capped 45 minutes ago. Um, and then we were able to get a pretty decent unmolding. Hey Mike, I know you're, you're behind with me, but the screen's behind. There have been like two questions on Facebook that I couldn't read. So when you get a chance, can you let me know what those questions were? Um, so the question is if one or two don't want to unmold, like mine, right? So it didn't unmold the first time. I, I hit it again. If things are like permanently stuck before we head to the sink, we'll, we'll toss our molds in the freezer, right? So that we force crystallization and um, we are able to get things out of the mold. Usually that happens either because my chocolate's not in temp really good temper when I put it in the mold in the first place or my filling was too warm. And so it took the chocolate back out of temper. It'll sometimes happen if our shells are too thin and then our filling doesn't crystallize really well, um, which can happen for a whole bunch of reasons. But, um, you know, temperature is one of them, formula, process, those types of things. But those are some things to think about. So let's cut one of these. Let's cut one of these in half, shall we? Um, okay, so we, there's the questions about polishing molds. Um, we, we all just, I'm having problems with the language. It's Tuesday, it's the afternoon, give me a moment. All right, so in addition to these live demos on Tuesdays, we also are doing what we call Chocolatier Chat on Fridays. Um, our first session was with a guy named Chris Harvey, who some of you may have heard of. Last week was with a guy named Christopher Elbow. Uh, this Friday is actually with um, Chris Curtin from Eclat. Last Chris in a row, I promise, and then we're gonna move on to some other people. Um, but we, in both of those conversations, we've had a lot of talk about polishing molds. I am not a mold polisher. It's not in my, my gig. Chris Harvey is a mold polisher and has a, when he teaches here, he does like a whole, almost 45 minutes on how to polish molds and how to polish molds perfectly. Um, Chris Elbow, on the other hand, who was with us this last week, is not a mold polisher. Has never been, he doesn't wash his molds. Um, as long as disaster doesn't strike, he moves from mold to mold. Um, if you are a mold polisher, the trick to remember is that you need something that uh, will not scratch your molds, right? So, Chris Harvey uses like makeup pads, um, when we're cleaning molds, if we have a, we have a problem with disaster strikes, we use um, chamois. Sort of in my theory, if it's good for a $45,000 automobile, it's probably okay for a $20 mold. Um, and I haven't said hi to everybody that's tuned in, but I am going to say hi to Tom Bowerweights because I appreciate him being here and I hope things are getting better for you at home. So I know Tom is uh, one of our partners. He works with Selmy, you know, and obviously, you know, Europe has been experiencing their own challenges. And so I hope things are getting better for you guys. And you know, it looks like it reading the paper. So, um, all right, so I think that answers polishing molds. I have cut one of these in half and you can see my shell is fairly thin. Where's my camera? There it is. But my base, because I didn't quite fill enough, is a little thicker and that's on me. Right, so that's and that's for me what that's the process that I did. So that means I want to put more filling. I want to put more filling in those shells. That's the trick to that. So um, delicious homemade jambuya made in a ball melt um, here and really tasty. Of course, jambuya makes me thirsty. But uh, needs this formula could have used a little sea salt. Would have been perfect. Um, so I think that is it for me this week. Unless Mike has any other questions, so we're going to give Mike one more opportunity to see if there are any other questions. So we got to wait like 15 seconds to catch up. The question was, do I have any success using wine fridges? The answer is yes. Wine fridges are nice because they are able to, you know, small fridges don't want to be set at 50 degrees. Health inspectors get a little antsy when we set, you know, a fridge to 50 degrees because they're afraid we're going to keep milk in there and that, you know, we're going to suddenly have sour cream. Um, 
but wine fridges are really designed to be in that sweet spot. You know, the, the better ones also have the ability to um, control humidity. The only challenge with them is that you don't always get really good airflow in them. And so it may behoove you to put some kind of little fan in there that circulates the air back to my heat exchange conversation from earlier that as you fill that, because they don't cool quickly, um, as you fill them, you'll raise the temperature up in the fridge. You know, and I've seen that also even in walk-ins, right? We had, we had a, I was with a customer that had converted a walk-in into a chocolate fridge. So they had it set at like 55 degrees. And as we rolled chocolate in on speed racks, right? We had challenges because where the speed racks were sitting, it would artificially raise the temperature and the temperature where the chocolate was, was getting up to like 85, 90 degrees. At that point, um, we would then have pieces in the middle that wouldn't un unmold and would have bloom issues and pieces on the outside would be fine. The chocolate was the same, the molds were the same, everything was the same. The difference was that there was not a consistent temperature throughout. So, which gets us also to a question that I just saw on Instagram, that why do some come out and some don't? Because there's something going on, right? There's something different. So we have to identify what's different. You know, sometimes it can be as simple as, you know, we've, we've damaged the cavity of the mold or we've washed the mold and we left a little bit of water in there or there's a little bit of soap scum or something in there. It could also be that my temper is not real consistent throughout, right? And so um, the chocolate somewhere is, is not crystallizing very well. Now, also we've been talking a lot about heat, right? So if I put my molds on the counter like this, there's more heat here than there is here. There's more uneven crystallization going on in the center and that sometimes will be the reason. So I'm also, I promise I'm going, any second, but we were talking about crystallization of chocolate. Right? I don't know if you can see it, but this is no longer in the same condition it was when I started, right? So that's something that I want to keep in mind while I'm working with the chocolate, all right? Because there have been a bunch of questions about crystallization and over crystallization. Yes, I could hit this with a heat gun, okay? Yes, I could also add melted chocolate to that. 115 degree chocolate or 50, 50 C chocolate, right? To, to break some of those crystals. The challenge with all those methods is that I just have to be careful. Because if I, if I hit it with too much heat gun or I add too much chocolate to it, too much melted chocolate to it, I will take the mold to the mass out of temper. All right? So, thanks everybody. Um, I really hope you can join us on Friday when we uh, spend some time with Chris Curtin of Eclat Chocolate in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Uh, Chris is, I've known Chris a long time. Chris is a pretty good friend and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about his business and what's going on in the world with him right now. And uh, come with lots of questions, feel free to email me ahead of time. Speaking of which, um, email for me is B Donaghy, D is in David, O-N-A-G-H-Y at uh, Tomrick.com. My Instagram is uh, Brian Donaghy, I think. Pretty sure. And then, but those are two great ways to reach me. Um, and feel free to ask us lots of questions. And uh, we'll hopefully we will see you later in the week. And then uh, we're looking for some suggestions on what to do next Tuesday. So uh, thanks a bunch and peace, everybody. Now the real challenge is whether or not I can turn these things off, which is I think I'm getting better at.